Thank you, thank you so much for being here. Thanks for having me here. It's a great pleasure. So I want to talk about uh, designing functional programs. I'll talk a little bit about functional programming, and then we'll talk about uh, you know how do we approach uh, designing it. Uh, one of the things that uh, fascinated me really was um, functional programming has been around for a very long time. Uh, in fact, let's kind of step back and look at uh, you know uh, Remy did a wonderful job of uh, you know introducing history for us. Let's talk about this a little bit. Uh, anyone remembers what year uh, object-oriented programming was introduced? Don't worry about being wrong. I'm wrong most of the time myself. Any any idea what year was it? Was it? Uh, yeah, 1967. Uh, two Norwegians, Dahl and Nygaard, uh, introduced uh, object-oriented programming. Anyone remembers what year object-oriented programming became mainstream? Like everybody started using it quietly. 1990, give or take, right? Uh, can you believe it? Uh, it took 23 years. If object-oriented programming was a human, it had a terrible childhood. Nobody really cared about it until it was 23 years old. Hey, do you want to hang out, right? Um, so when people tell me that in computer science things change really fast, I often ask them, what are you smoking? Things don't change really fast. In fact, it takes forever. Um, in fact, there's a reason why things take 15, 20 years. And that's called a new generation. Uh, old people like me get stuck in the ways we do stuff. We, uh, we, we are excited about what we do. And then once we figure it out, we hold on to it very tightly. Until the kids come over and say, why are you doing this? And then they kick us out and then they start doing different things. So it takes a lot of time for things to actually change. Uh, anyone remembers what year the concepts, the mathematical concepts, the lambda calculus was introduced? Anyone remembers that? Yeah, it was 1929. Can you believe that? Everyone here knows about um, Alan Turing. This was Alan Turing's professor, Alonzo Church, who introduced uh, lambda calculus in 1929. Anyone remembers what year functional programming became mainstream? Okay, that was a trick question. <laughs> no, not yet. Yeah, that's the right answer. Not yet. So a good 90 years later, we are still getting excited about this, right? It's, it's a funny world we actually live in. So functional programming has been around for a very long time. And one of the things that we talk about in functional programming is assignment-less programming. What in the world is assignment-less programming? It is where you don't mutate anything, period. And then you look back and say, is it even possible to write a program where you don't mutate anything? I'm going to show you one such program. This program doesn't change anything, doesn't mutate anything, and here you go. There you go. That's a program where nothing is mutated. Um, it doesn't do anything useful also, but that's besides the point, right? So in practical terms, it's almost impossible for us to even imagine creating a program where nothing gets mutated. Well, I'm going to make a claim about this. Let's think, of, th think about this a little bit differently. So what does it really mean to be uh, you know, programming in assignment-less programming? And, and for that, let's talk about something a little different. Let's call the function called blah. Let's say blah here. I want you to take a close look at the error you're getting. Notice the error is not a statement. Just keep that in mind, not a statement. Now I'm going to say go to. Now, obviously, nobody in this room, I would think, dares to write go to. Because the minute you put go to, Dijkstra moves in his grave. Because he wrote this phenomenal paper called Go To Is Evil, and nobody would be crazy enough to use go to. But look at the error really closely. Not, not a statement. It says illegal start of expression. Oh my goodness, what does that really mean? Illegal start of expression says, Java says, go to is a legal keyword, but I dare you to use it. So they don't want us to use the keyword go to, but it's actually a valid keyword in Java. So obviously nobody would care to use go to. OK, fine, fine. Let's do something else. Int i equal to 0, i less than 10, let's say. And then I will say i plus plus. But in this case, I'll go ahead and say, if i is greater than 5, uh, 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 greater than 5, let's say, then I want to go ahead and print out the value of i. Uh, rather a really trivial example. Uh, what do we call this as? Well, we know what this exactly is. We call this as structured programming. 
So structured programming, what in the world is that? Structured programming is where we have a nice structure in the code. We got a for, we got an if statement, we got while loops, we got all these beautiful structures. And what is one of the key things about structures and structured programming? There's a single entry point, there's a single end, uh, exit point. Why, why is that important? Well, we are in this such a beautiful room in this fantastic place, but it doesn't matter where we are, we'd be perfectly okay if that door opens and somebody comes in through this room. That's pretty logical. It's perfectly agreeable if somebody gets up and walks through the door as well. But it would be really freaky if suddenly somebody appears next to you right now as you're sitting. Like, oh my goodness, where did he come from, right? That's exactly what go to is. Go to is like the code just bolts and it says, I'm here. It's like, where'd you come from? Where's the context of this code, right? So we say go to is evil, we shouldn't use it. Go to is to structured programming. But on the other hand, going back to this code for a second, when I run this code, that's a structured program, we all know this. But let's step back for a second and take a look at what we just have. Java P, let's say, minus C for a minute. Well, minus C is already an option on my machine, I've alias did. And I'm going to say class a sample dot class. Let's take a look at what this has to tell us real quick. If you look at this code, this is a bytecode generated from that piece of code we saw. But when you look into it, look at the beautiful <laughs> thing right here. Oh my goodness, what in the world is that? Well, that's a go to, isn't it? Well, go to is like matches. Everyone has matches in their home, right? But you don't go to kids and say, kids, I'm going to go take a shower. Here are some matches for you to play with. I hope you don't do that. <laughs> well, go-tos are there, but like matches, they are for adults to use, not for kids to play with. <laughs> so the point really is, while there is go-to, we don't, of course, use that in code. So what does it really mean to say structured programming? What it means is, it's kind of like go-to. It's go-to is there under the hood, but it's just that we don't use go-to. In a similar way, go to is to structured programming as assignment, uh, assignment uh, is to functional uh, programming. So what I really mean by that is no explicit assignment is what we really talk about. So what does it really mean by no explicit assignment? No explicit assignment simply means we don't do assignment in our code, but it doesn't mean there is no assignment at all. It is quite possible, in fact, it's quite realistic, that there is assignment in the code below the code we use, but it's just that we don't use assignment, much like there is go to in the code below the code we use, but it's just we don't use a go to in our code. So just like we don't use explicit go to, but there is go to, we don't use explicit assignment, but there is assignment. So that is one thing to keep in mind when it comes to assignmentless programming. It's not that mutability is something we should completely avoid, we don't do mutability. Now, obviously, the question is why? Because if you use mutability in your code, your code becomes really hard to understand. Your code becomes hard to reason. Your code becomes hard to maintain. Your code hard becomes hard to make it efficient. Your code becomes hard to parallelize. So by avoiding assignment in your code, you can remove all that problem. But then you say, wait a minute. If they do it under the hood in that code they wrote, Hasn't the problem just be shifted? Well, the point really is, if they do assignment, all the problems I mentioned become their problem and not your problem. And in life, you make everything other people's problem, right? That's usually a good philosophy. You don't have to worry about it. They take care of it. It's not your problem. You're not your concern. So that's one of the reasons why you want to really favor immutability in your code. I'll, I'll come back to this in just a few minutes. But the next thing we do is use of high order functions. What does it really mean to use higher order functions? Well, when it comes to this, let's take a little example for a minute. Let's say I want to create a collection of numbers. So I have a list of numbers, let's say 1 to 10. And what I want to do in this list is, let's say I find the double of, let's say total of, double of even numbers. Well, how do we do this in the imperative style of programming? Well, we'll first of all say total equal to 0. We want to really output this value of total when we are done with it. But within this, we could say for int element coming from numbers. And then, of course, we would say if element mod 2 is equal to 0, 
then of course we will say that it is total is plus equal to the element times 2. So this is giving us the total of the double of all the even numbers. When we run the code, of course, it produces a result of 60. Anyone here has written the code like this before? Of course, right? Nobody wants to raise the hand because we are so ashamed of that. That's perfectly understandable. But the more important question is, how do you feel when you write code like this? I'll tell you how you feel about it. You feel absolutely dirty. Because when you go home at the end of a long day coding, the children come running towards you and you say, don't touch me. I got to go shower at first, right? That's how we feel about it. Because that's a burden we carry with us, writing code at this low level of abstraction every single day. But what we can do instead is we can write the code. This is the imperative style code where we tell what to do and also how to do. So this is one of the things we do in imperative style. So imperative style is you tell what and also, unfortunately, also how. So um, this is a lot of work for us. You tell what to do. So tell what to do uh, uh, and also uh, how to do. So this is a burden we carry with us. In the declarative style, you tell what and not uh, really a uh, how. So this is a nice way to program in declarative style where you focus on what you want to do, not on how to do it. So what do we do in this style of programming? We can simply say over here numbers.stream, where streams provide the internal iteration. We say filter given an element, element mod 2 is equal to 0, we get all the even numbers. We say map to int, in this case, return a double of that value that's given to us, and we perform a sum operation on it, and then we simply return the result back to the caller. Well, it turns out this code also produces the same result, but it is a lot more expressive in the, in the way that we are writing the code. So given this, of course, this is a lot easier way to express the code. This is called the declarative style. But of course the question is, what in the world is then functional style of programming? Well, it turns out there is a really nice relationship between these two. Before we talk about it, let's talk about normal functions, or maybe we'll call it as our regular functions. I don't even know what we would call them as, stuff we normally use. So what do we do? We pass an uh, object to a function. This is what we do normally. Uh, we may uh, create uh, uh, an object. So we create object uh, in a function. And then finally, we return an uh, object uh, from a function. So this is what we typically do when we create normal functions. But instead of doing this, what we could also do here is call the so-called higher order functions. And in the case of higher order functions, what we are going to do is we pass a function to a function, we create a function in a function, and we return a function from a function. And that makes it what's called a higher order function. So a higher order function is where in addition to doing object composition, we can also do functional composition as well. Well, okay, if that's what functional style really is, then what's the relationship between declarative and functional? If you look at this line of code right here, we would argue this is declarative because we are telling what to do and uh, instead of telling how to do. But on the other hand, if you notice this line of code and also this line of code right here, both of those are declarative as well. However, notice you are passing a, a, a function to a, another function, so that becomes a higher order function. In other words, filter is a higher order function because we are passing a function to the filter function. Similarly, if you notice over here, this is a declarative plus higher order function. And now that brings us to what a functional style of programming really is. So what in the world is really functional style of programming? It turns out functional uh, style uh, of programming uh, is really uh, a combination of things is uh, declarative plus the use of uh, higher order functions. So this is the relationship between the functional style of programming and the declarative style of programming, which is what really makes it very powerful because in the declarative style, we're able to write code that's very expressive. And as a result, we are able to leverage the declarative style. Not all declarative programming is functional, but all functional programming is declarative in nature. 
And that becomes really efficient and easy to express the code because the, it removes the accidental complexity from the code as we are, are, are working with it. So the declarative style of programming is built on the grounds of uh, declarative style of programming and goes further to use the higher order functions that makes it really expressive and, and powerful to work with. But what is really important in this case is the two concepts which are fundamental to the functional style of programming. In fact, I'm going to say that it, it, when we talk about functional programming, we often talk about uh, immutability uh, and uh, also, uh, we, we talk a lot about immutability, but we also, <laughs> it says Im immaturity, <laughs> so uh, immutability, uh, we, but we also talk about uh, higher order functions. Um, but we, uh, I'm going to say, uh, but these are uh, really uh, means uh, to a bigger or greater uh, end. So what is that really greater end we are really after? So in, in terms of functional programming, it is not the immutability that's really important. It's not the higher order function that's important. What is really important uh, in this case is the functional composition and a lazy evaluation. So what are the reasons why these two are extremely important? Uh, part of the reason is functional composition really gives us the ability to express our code. We are able to nicely flow through the ideas of this fu functional pipeline of transforming the data from one state of confidence to the next one, to the next one, to the next one, that gives us the functional composition. It makes the code really expressive. So here's a way to think about it. Uh, think about it as expressive. And what does expressiveness really mean? Expressiveness means the code is very easy to communicate. Expressive means the code has, doesn't have the accidental complexity that you often have in the code. But expressive code is very beautiful because if you look at the code like this, if you write a for loop and tell people to find out what the for loop is doing, they're trying to understand what the code is doing. Often the term they will use is, let me figure out what the code is doing. I don't want people to figure out what the code is doing. I want it to be obvious what the code is doing. Well, on the other hand, look at the one pass, single pass through the code. Given all the numbers in the collection, given me only the even numbers, but double the values and then total it, Notice how the code is very expressive. That is functional composition. However, we have to be very careful about this. And I have this theory, and I think I can eventually prove this theory. And the theory that I have is uh, cuteness uh, is not sustainable. Um, so, um, so this is something I have realized over and over and over. Uh, cuteness is not sustainable. Uh, look at the humans, poor humans. When a baby is born, what's the very first thing you say? How cute. And babies are very cute. They are cute for two years of their lives. <laughs> and after that you say, you talk too much, be quiet. And the baby is no longer cute anymore. This is the problem with cuteness, right? It doesn't sustain for too long. And, and the same very beautiful kid, the little, little small baby, takes its very small pinky and sticks into the nose. What do you say? Oh my goodness, and you take a photo of it. The same kid grows to 12 years, takes the same pinky, puts in the nose, you say, what are you doing that's gross? This is unfair, but this is unsustainable, right? So cuteness, I can give you several evidences of this. It's not sustainable at all. So if you want sustainability, uh, we care about uh, performance. We definitely want performance. And this is why these are combinations that are extremely important. Functional composition gives us expressiveness. And this end is extremely important. And efficiency comes from laziness. So we really need both of those in combination with each other. And this is one of the reasons why those two are extremely important to bring together. Function composition gives us expressiveness. Lazy evaluation gives us the efficiency in code. We, we don't want one without the other. We have lived the life of that already. You had efficiency in imperative style, but not expressiveness. Nobody survived maintaining that code, isn't it? The people who have to maintain that code, 
They're not called programmers, they're called victims. We don't really <laughs> enjoy the journey. So on one hand, we have efficient code, which is not expressive. On the other hand, you can write code that is expressive, but it's not efficient, nobody cares about it. So for sustainability, you actually need both of those, and that is one of the key things you really want to have. So from that point of view, some of the design concerns we have to be very careful about. And, and that is, what is lazy evaluation? Lazy evaluation is where a piece of code is not evaluated until it is absolutely needed. Let's think about what laziness really means. Think of this example. Let's say on January the 1st, the boss calls you into the office and has a meeting with you. And the boss tells you, you're going to work on a very important project and the final report is due on April the 15th. What do you do? You come out of the meeting, go to your desk, and you immediately start on this project, right? No, of course not. <laughs> well, you're going to start on it on April the 14th, because you know it's you on the next morning. In fact, you know something that the boss doesn't know. You're going to quit on March the 1st. Why in the world would you start on this project? And what is that called? That's called being smart, isn't it? And I learned this lesson really well when I was a, ch in a child. You know, when I was in school, there were these students who would read every single day. We call them the losers, right? Because they would read every single day. People like me, we would read the night before the exam. You see, there's a lot of things that are variable in this world. The exam is three months away. A lot of things can happen. There could be a storm on the day of the exam. The entire city could be shut down. The teacher may die before the exam. There are so many possibilities. Why would you really start on it earlier, right? And what is that called? Efficiency, isn't it? That's the whole point about this. So what you really want to do here is, if I go to this code and say sample transform, let's just take a look at this example real quick, how this works. And I'm going to go back to this code, and I'm going to then say I want to perform this operation. I have this method called transform, so public static, let's say, uh, int transform takes a number as input, and what I'm going to do is simply return number times 2, and you can see the code produce the same output as it, before, as it did before. However, if I'm going to output called right here, notice when I execute this code, it said call that many times and produce that result. Let's go remove this little output for a minute. Let's go ahead and just run this code again, and you can see that it actually produced the output again as well. How, and, and of course, at the very end, I will simply say done, so we can actually see all that call and done. However, if I come in here and remove just the terminal operation alone, now notice when I execute the code, it simply said done. It doesn't really execute that little code in the middle, and, and that, of course, is laziness, lazy evaluation. This is one of the things that really hooked me on to streams, is because streams are fundamentally lazy. And, and to me, the fact that Java had lambdas did not honestly excite me at all. Uh, in fact, when I first wrote the, the, uh, I wrote the first book on Java 8, uh, it was released the day Java 8 was released, but one of the things I wrote in that book, uh, when I wrote uh, what I wrote, my editor called me and said, are you sure you want to say something like this in a technical book? I said, well, you got to remember I live in Colorado, I said. And, and my editor said, okay, fine, and hung up the line. What I wrote in the book was that lambdas are the gateway drug, streams are the real addiction. Not that I have anything to do with the drug culture in Colorado, but the point really is that what you really get hooked on to is the streams API, because that's where the real power is. The laziness built into streams gives you that efficiency. That's extremely critical. But of course, for this, you have to be some, uh, extremely careful about this. Let's see what the problem really is. Notice that, let's change this problem just a little bit to understand why this is critical. Let's say for a minute, we're going to create a stream, and we will say dot map, and we will say given an element e, e times 2. Now what in the world are we doing here? We are passing what's called a lambda expression. That's what we are doing here, it's a lambda expression. I'm going to store this away into a stream right here. So in this case, I say stream of integer, and we'll say stream is equal to. Then what I'm going to do here is stream dot, let's say, 
And in this case, we will say stream dot for each, and we will simply say system dot out and print print, and we'll just print it out. So in this case, as you can see, when I print this out, it prints the values of all the double of the values in this collection, so that was pretty easy to see. One of the things I want to emphasize is lambdas really are stateless. So lambdas don't have any state. They don't carry any state. They take an input and they produce an output, and that's pretty much what it is. Lambdas are pretty stateless. On the other hand, rather than writing a code like this, let's try something a little different. Let's say instead of this, let's go ahead and define a stream this time. But this stream says two times factor. Now, what in the world does a factor really, where does it come from? Well, the factor is not part of this particular lambda expression. Well, it's got to get it from someplace. What I can then do is I can say final int factor is equal to 2. I want you to look, look at this very closely. You are in main function, which means you are on stack level number 1. Then you are calling the map function. Within the map, you're on stack level 2. Within the map, you call the lambda. Now you're in level 3 of the stack. So if you want to think about it, this is like the main is like on the, on the streets of the city. This map is a level above. And this lambda is like where we are several you know, hundred feet above the ground. Now, is it even possible for this to stretch its very long hand and grab this value from the stack of the main? The short answer is it can't. So how in the world can this factor be available in the lambda when it's available within the stack over here? And the short answer is it carries it with it. In a way, if you really think about it, imagine I really believe in having a really healthy lunch but if my workplace is 10 kilometers away from my home, how in the world can I have a home-cooked meal for lunch if I care about having a really good lunch and save time at the same time? Well, I can carry the lunch with me. This is a very prudent solution. When you leave for work in the morning, you carry lunch with you. That's exactly what's happening. So what does this really do? This lambda has to close over. In fact, you can try this. It's a close over. So this lambda is going to close over the defining scope uh, to bind to this variable up here. If you find yourself in an empty room, say the word close over a lot of times really, really fast, it will begin to sound like closure. A closure is nothing but a close over. A close over, it closes over the binding scope. What's really cool about a closure is a closure carries a state with it. What is really important to keep in mind is, this is a common mistake people do, uh, closure carries, I want to emphasize, immutable state with it. So it's extremely important for us to uh, carry an immutable state. So line number 10 is a lambda, line number 16 is a closure, but that factor better be immutable. So this is a very common mistake people often do. So when I run this code, notice it is 2, 4, and 6. On the other hand, let's try something a little different. I'm going to say a factor over here is equal to 2. Now notice where you get a compilation error. The compilation error is line number 18. Why is the error on line 18? The reason there's an error on line 18 is you're trying to modify a final variable. You're not allowed to modify a final variable. Everybody knows it. And Java says, don't do this. It's a bad idea. You should not modify a final variable. Well, of course, we won't do that. On the other hand, I'm going to remove this word final. What is this called? This is called effectively final. What in the world is effectively final? Well, Java says, you and I have been going out together for 20 years we can understand each other a little bit. You don't need the ceremony of wearing the rings as long as you know how to behave out there. So that's exactly the point. You're treating it like it's final, which means it's effectively final. Now, because this is effectively final, it is all for practical purposes immutable. You're not mutating it. So using it here is perfectly safe. 
So one of the things you have to be very careful about is uh, lambdas. So lambdas uh, uh, and uh, closures uh, have to be pure. Now, what is a pure function? I want to define the definite, give the definition of purity. So what is a pure function? Well, if you, so a pure function, if you send uh, the same input, uh, you will get the same output no matter how many times you call it. So this is a pure function. As long as you keep sending the same input, you'll keep getting the same output in a pure function. But there are two rules of purity. And what are the two rules of purity? The first rule of purity, everyone would say, of course, it's kind of, you know, very obvious. And that is, the function does not modify, modify anything, right? So this is kind of obvious. A pure function doesn't modify anything. But it's the rule number two that a lot of people miss uh, realizing. It is as important, equally important to the first one. And that is, the, the function uh, does not depend on anything that may possibly change. This rule number two is extremely important for purity. If a function were to depend on something that possibly changes, then the function is not pure. Look at line number 16. The lambda in line 16 is pure. Why is it pure? Because E is an input which doesn't change. It's an integer which is immutable. Factor is effectively final. As a result, it's immutable. Life is good. However, there is something we got to be very careful about. Uh, Java <laughs> assumes that lambdas uh, and closures are pure. And the most important word here is it assumes. And when a language assumes things, and when you disagree with it, you know who's going to get hurt. And this is something you have to be very careful about. This is the difference between where functional programming was emphasized in languages like Lisp and Haskell. Languages like Lisp and Haskell are purely functional. In Haskell, you cannot mutate things. Haskell will enforce immutability. Haskell will not tell you, please don't mutate. It will tell you, don't mutate. It will follow you home. It will sit next to you when you're having dinner. And it will tell you, I just saw what you thought right there. Don't even try that. And it will threaten you if you try to mutate anything. Java is like a good friend. It will tell you in private, you know what? You don't do such stuff. And then it'll walk away. It won't haunt you down and hunt you down. It'll just assume you follow the good things. Now, this is something you have to be very careful about. Notice now, I go back to this exact code we saw a minute ago, but this time, what I'm going to do here is in this example, I'm going to take this code and right in this code right here, I'm going to say factor is equal to two again. Notice I am mutating this particular variable. Sorry, it is no longer effectively final because I've effectively modified it. Now very carefully notice where the error is. A minute ago, when I had the final, the error was on line number 18. Without the word final, notice where the error is. The error is on line number 16, not on line number 18. Why? Java is trying to protect you. And Java says, excuse me, please don't do this. Because if you do, your code, your function is, your lambda is no longer pure. This is not a good programming practice. Java is warning you. Well, this is a good thing. But unfortunately, you know how some programmers are at work. You know who I'm talking about. Because they will have a vicious smile on their face. And they will tell you, they will roll up their sleeves and say, let me tell you how to beat the Java compiler. Better to stay away from these programmers, very dangerous programmers. And they will walk over to this code, and they will put a square bracket here. And they will pause and look at you with a big smile. And then they will say, new 
in square bracket, and then they will tickle their eyebrow a little bit at you. This law, you know this is becoming dangerous at this point. And then what they will do is they'll put a square bracket zero, and they'll put a square bracket zero, and they will say, the code didn't compile a minute ago, now, oh, somebody's taking a photo, let me just say, don't do this. So, uh, this is becoming dangerous, because if you take a photo, and somebody said, this guy is stupid. I always put this immediately, don't do this. Well, why is this such a bad idea? Because notice now, the compiler doesn't complain anymore. But don't assume Java doesn't care. At this point, Java is in a bit of a shock, honestly. If you look at Java C, Java C will be shaking on the disk. It is thinking, who are your parents? How did they create you like this? And it's thinking so deeply about how Mr. this programmer really is. Why is this such a bad idea? The reason this is a bad idea is, if I change this to a zero, now the question is, what is the result of this code? Well, how many of you think the result is going to be 2, 4, and 6 still? Don't worry about being wrong again. Okay, some people absolutely. Who thinks it's going to be all zeros? A few of us. Honestly, who thinks I have no clue? <laughs> absolutely, right? And that is the whole point. I use this question in interviews all the time. I'll put this question and ask them, what's the answer? When the candidate is about to answer, gets ready to answer, I tell them you're fired before you are hired. Because the right answer to this question is, are you all stupid to write code like this? Then you're hired, right? Because I want to write production code. I don't want to write code where it's a Java puzzler and everybody's trying to figure it out. This is a really bad code, and that's because lazy evaluation kicks in all the time. So something we've got to be very careful about uh, immutability is absolutely, uh, uh, absolutely uh, necessary for lazy evaluation. So you cannot have immutability, sorry, you cannot have laziness without immutability. So one of the reasons why functional programming quickly emphasizes immutability is because they want to provide efficiency through laziness. Once we understand that, we are really motivated to work through immutability. In a way, I would argue, immutability is like vegetables. Trying to tell programmers to keep things immutable is like trying to tell children that they have to eat vegetable. No wonder they don't really like it. So when we motivate it and give really good reasons, it becomes really easy to do it. So we talked about purity of functions and the rules of purity and why purity is extremely important. So the question then is, how practical is it to really do it? Well, the answer to that is, if you're programming in languages like Haskell and Lisp, it's fairly easy to do because the language is really emphasizing immutability. But what if you're programming in a language like Java, what can you do? So for that, what I recommend is this little uh, idea of circle of purity and a ring of impurity. So what I mean by that is, imagine that you have a little circle and that's a circle of purity. Within that circle, you don't write any code that mutates anything. You only transform data. Around that circle, you create a very thin ring, and the ring of impurity. And that ring of impurity, it's kind of like a little ring that we used to throw around and play. And that ring, or the, like a frisbee, the rim of it can contain impurity. This completely reverts our design and architecture. What do we normally do in architecture? We put the database in the middle, and then we are writing all the code that pulls the data down. And given this pipeline, what if we were to think about this as a pipeline, like a train, where the train has multiple cars in it? And if you think about it as a train, is it a good idea to get into a train? Absolutely, if you don't get into a train, nobody can go anywhere. What about getting out of the train? That's a really good idea too. Otherwise, we are being held hostage on the train. But while it's a good idea to get into a train, good idea to get out of a train, it is never a good idea to get in or out of a train while the train is in motion. So the point really is, do all the mutability you want before you get into the function pipeline. Do all the mutability you want after you get out of the pipeline, but you never do it while in the middle of a pipeline. So what you really want to do is to make sure 
that you avoid not mutability, but you avoid shared mutability. So by avoiding shared mutability, we can still honor the functional paradigm in languages like Java. But the minute we don't regard immutability, immutability and we start making shared mutability in our code, then all bits are off. The code may try to behave correctly today, but it's really a code that's going to mess up. I get emails almost every single week. Somebody would start the email saying, this code worked fine until yesterday. I don't even read anymore. I'll directly go to the point where they are mutating and say, there you go, that's the problem. You should avoid these kinds of mutability in code. We should really try to do it. So that's one thing to consider is to do the circle of purity and, and, and move the immutability, move the uh, mutability to the peripheral and keep the middle really pure. And, and so we want to start thinking in functional style of programming. So think about function composition and think about the ability to do lazy evaluations. But there's one other unfortunate thing about this, and that is how do we deal with exceptions? Uh, the first problem with exception is calling it exception. We should have called it normal. Instead, we called it exception, and we get really angry when it happens. Stuff happens, things fail, we have to deal with it. But unfortunately, though, the problem with exception is exception handling is a completely uh, imperative mindset. I'm going to say the following thing, and that is uh, exception uh, handling and functional programming uh, are uh, really mutually exclusive. So uh, they are not orthogonal, they are actually mutually exclusive. It doesn't really make sense to mix exception handling and functional style of programming together. So what is the answer? How do we really deal with this in reality? One uh, way to really embrace the functional mindset Unfortunately, Java 8 doesn't handle this properly. We'll talk about this in the next presentation. Well, one thing to learn from is how JavaScript promises does this. Another way to look at it is the completable future. Uh, so if you look at the completable future uh, in Java, uh, this is really promises in the JavaScript world brought to Java, if you will, and see how they handle really the failures. They uh, literally have different uh, you know, channels for uh, data versus error, and this is exactly what we can learn from in the reactive, flowable, and observable as well. But I think that's a really nice segue into my next presentation. We'll talk about that in that presentation. Uh, but I want to just spend a couple of minutes. Any questions or comments on what we talked about uh, before we jump on to the next topic after that? I just want to spend my, a few minutes just listening to you if you have any questions or comments. I'll be uh, uh, delighted to hear your point of view. So fire away. Please. Um. <laughs> he, he's testing me if I can deal with time out. Time out. <laughs> um, the, the question is uh, how you can be how okay how you can be uh, pure and lazy. How can you be pure and lazy? Because if you are lazy, you have two states, evaluated or not evaluated. So you have state. Yeah. So, so the key for this really is, so the question is, you know, how do we be pure and lazy at the same time? In fact, I would argue uh, purity is mandatory for laziness. So the reason for that is, let's step back and say what laziness really means. Uh, laziness really means deferred evaluation, isn't it? Which means I, I may not compute at all, or I may compute later, or I may partly compute at a later time. So it really comes down to the timing of a change. Yeah, but um, if, if you have lazy as deferred evaluation, yeah. it's not the same as lazy in ASCAP. Because in Haskell, if you ask twice a value, Go ahead. you will keep the value. In, in a stream, if you ask twice the value, you will get an exception. You can evaluate. Oh, no, no, no. Once. Let's not confuse the evaluation of a stream. That's an implementation detail, right? No. What I would argue. Technically, it's not. If you want performance, you need the stream um, 
you also need the VM to see the whole stream as one thing, right. and not something separate. Right, but that's more of a, I would say, a deficiency of implementation in Java, the fact that streams are not reusable, right? So once you run the evaluation through a stream, you can reevaluate that particular stream. However, that's not what I'm talking about. The, what I'm talking about is when you have a stream, the evaluations in the stream are lazily eva evaluated. So when you build a stream, the evaluation doesn't happen. It's when you evaluate the stream when the evaluation actually happens. I, I, I prefer a different evaluation than lazy evaluation because for a lot of people, lazy means you are able to get the value several times. Uh, and it's not right, and, and in the, I would argue you have to, the, again, I will go back to the efficiency. If you recreate the stream any number of times, you'll get the same results as long as you've not mutated anything. Yeah. So, so in that regard, you can be lazy because the result of the evaluation, the purity is still the case, right? Because you cannot evaluate a stream multiple times, but you can recreate a stream any number of times and then rerun your evaluations at that point. So again, I would say this is a deficiency more than, uh, you know, uh, it's a consequence of how Java has done things more than the effect of the streams in general, or the pipeline in general. So it's not the deficiency of the pipeline approach, it's a deficiency of the Java approach. Any other questions or comments? Yeah? So uh, you, you use the nice images to say, look, lazy is just going to be more efficient because you know, somebody that doesn't do something is better than somebody that does. Right? So, okay. When the result is not used, that is. Yes, but yeah, the, the argument I was having with uh, Vincent next to me is like, well, but in practice, we are writing this code to actually do something. So at the end of the day, you will very likely evaluate you know, 99 or 100 percent of it. So no, not really. That's, that's an, uh, that I don't think that's a really good you, assumption. You, you, you so can only take one value and not the whole stream. So, so what Instead you're really getting is, you, in fact, it's even, even more uh, uh, powerful because if you look at a stream itself, uh, imagine that you're drawing a, a fairly big pipeline of these operations. So this could go on for any number of transformations. What you don't know at this point is what your final uh, goal here is, right? This goal is not known yet because you're, you're defining transformations. But the goal may say, I need all the values. And if you do, then you're going to be doing all the evaluations that are required. But the goal may not really be that I need all the results. Like you said, the goal may be, get me the first result. Or it doesn't even have to be first, but it could be, I want seven values and not thousand values. So for example, I may say, given all the people in the room, I'm interested only in, in four people who meet this criteria because maybe I have four things to give away. So, so and, and the point is that the place where you're building a pipeline could very well be different from the place where you're evaluating the goal or the end result. And, and uh, the eagerness would in, in evaluate, uh, uh, do a lot more work. The laziness says, you know what, defer it until you find out what the real goal is. That, that's, the, that's the benefit you get out of it. Have you seen the goal evaluation being done in a very different place in Java? Because all of the examples we're seeing of streams is like just one big blob. Yeah, that's just the examples we have seen. Doesn't yes. mean that's the way it's got to be done. Yeah, but yeah. In practice so far. Yeah. No, uh, again, practice is what we do, right? So we just need to practice differently, that's all. Yeah. Hey, Any other questions or comments? You, you have a small yes, uh, thing. I got a time out uh, Sorry. Uh, I'm going to take questions <laughs> from there. Yes. A little louder, please. When I have a pipeline of functions like this one, uh, we have a stream, and after we are, we are applying a modification of the, our stream, a map, a filter, flat map, etc., uh, each time we are using the mutable, that means we are returning a new collection or new stream, and this is, does not promote another order of the virtual machine. Right. So, so the, let's step back for a second and answer the question a little differently. The question is, you know, we are continuously creating multiple streams, uh, are we not really resulting in inefficiency of doing this, right? So one of the things to keep in mind really is the following, and that is, uh, think about it this way. So I'm gonna say it in a slightly different way. Uh, when you deal with a, with a list, let's say list versus let's say uh, a stream, I want you to think about the word uh, bucket for a minute. If you think of a bucket, a bucket is what we use to store water, for example. And then if you put water in the bucket, you can carry it around. 
A uh, list is more like a bucket. On the other hand, a stream is more like a pipe. So you don't store things in a pipe, you float things in a pipe. So it's a fairly different model. So list is a collection of data, whereas a stream is a collection but of functions and not data. So, so one of the beautiful things about streams is, streams are not really collecting data. So this is one of the reasons why it's important to understand about the semantics. In the case of, uh, uh, if you do this in language like Ruby or even Python or JavaScript by using the regular implementation, you will go from one collection to another collection to another collection. The more garbage you create, the more garbage you collect. That's not going to be very efficient. What, on the other hand, what streams actually do is they do what's called fusion. So they actually take the intermediate operations, whatever operations that are in between, and they actually fuse the functions to, to create a collection of functions. So here's a way to think about it. Uh, the way to think about it is, uh, think about streams this way. A stream does not uh, execute uh, each function for each value uh, uh, instead, uh, it, it executes uh, a collection of functions uh, for each value, uh, but only as necessary. So essentially what this means is, uh, a stream says, if you give me you know, four functions, I am not going to take every single value and run through the first one and then come to the second one. It doesn't do it. Instead of what the stream does is, it creates a collection of these functions. So those functions you provided, it fuses them internally. And then it says, I'm going to treat that collection of functions as one entity. And then I'm going to decide what values to pass through, but only as necessary. So you have created a stream of functions, not streams of data. So if you have a million pieces of data, but you have seven functions, you have used up memory to create the functional pipeline, but that's not an order of n or n square. In fact, it has no consequence on the size of the data, because it's a function you have grouped together, not related to the data size at all. So that's kind of where the efficiency really comes in. Uh, it's not about, comparatively, how efficient it is to doing it imperatively, but it's more of, it's not as inefficient as creating a collection of data over and over and over. This is one of the reasons why we have to really understand what the languages actually do, because that, that's a semantical issue, and, and that has a bearing on the performance as well. So we have to be very careful about it. That's all I have. We'll take a short break, and when we come back, we'll talk about the reactors.